thank you for the opportunity, Yash and team. I'm, I'm really happy to be here and, and share my perspectives. Uh, and then what I'd like to do is to go over a, a bit of uh, uh, an introduction uh, to, to uh, flagship and pioneering medicines. I uh, also give uh, my perspective on where some of the trends are. You know, most of you might be quite familiar with it, uh, but just to set that as a context for the digitalization framework, also share a few examples in terms of how we are thinking about this in our context, uh, and lastly also in terms of where we can go from here. Um, and of course, the objective that is not there is uh, to see if I can do this well enough that Yash actually invites me for a future event, yeah? So, so, so that's part two of the, uh, of the expectation. Um, so, with that, I, uh, I want to share, for, for those of you who are not familiar, Flagship is a biotech venture capital firm, uh, look, you know, I guess headquartered here, just uh, a mile from here. Um, and, and one of the unique things about Flagship is uh, we are an end-to-end -end VC, meaning we found, uh, we develop, and eventually grow them uh, and then take it all the way to, to, to public markets. Um, so uh, our primary focus uh, uh, has historically been human health and uh, planetary health. Of course, now we are also getting into uh, uh, intelligence, AI-driven uh, companies, so that's our new focus area as well. Now, how do we do this? Uh, uh, you know, if you look at uh, some, of the, some of the numbers, we've started in 2000, 100 plus companies have been invented uh, or started. Uh, about 30 of them have, have gone public, so quite uh, successful in terms of uh, the, the rate of uh, uh, you know, creating those companies. What also is quite nice is it is one under one umbrella. We have uh, uh, scientists who are truly asking those big questions. What if uh, we can uh, use an mRNA to produce an antibody? Of course, we know now the answer is Moderna, but when it started, it was one of those to say, you got to be kidding me. But we all know, unless you ask those kinds of questions, we don't change the practice of medicine. Uh, so to have those scientists there, and then once you have a science, to be able to bring the venture capitalists who are able to raise the big funds that we need to invest in those ideas. And lastly, also entrepreneurs who are then able to take it from an idea to building a company and all the way forward. Um, so we have about 9,400 associates. I think that was probably even an old number uh, you know, right now. And if you look at the portfolio of, of, of companies and, and the clinical trials that uh, we were doing, it's, it's quite impressive in terms of scale. And lastly, of course, uh, you know, uh, we are also getting ready to raise our eighth round, but what you see there is some of the previous rounds, right? So we've been, um, been able to raise some big funds to invest in our, uh, in our business. And, and the way we do this is, is through a, uh, you know, a, a pretty institutionalized process, I'd say, right? And the first question, of course, is to ask, what if? What if, uh, you know, again, like I said, um, uh, use mRNA to produce an antibody, right? And that, that's just a hypothesis starts. And for example, in that particular case, it was 2010, where that question was asked. And then you say, okay, well, it's a hypothesis. Here is a small pot of money. Try to see what, what you can do in terms of small experiments. You do those experiments, then it becomes a protocol. And once you show that you actually have a platform, um, then the question becomes, okay, now where do we take this? That's where you hire a board, uh, you know, you have a team. Uh, you know, leadership team, that's where it becomes a new co. And once it gets to that, that stage, you then say, now I have a platform, right? You know, pretty much saying I have a hammer. What are those nails I want to hit? What are the big um, medicines I want to think about, right? That's where it becomes a growth co. And eventually, uh, you take it to the public market, right? And that's where it becomes a public co, right? So that's a institutionalized process that we, um, we have uh, in, our, in our ecosystem. And, um, what, what, what became obvious in all of that, in, in each of these, if you think about it, all of these platform companies, again, are really innovative, right? So for example, we have, what if you can use uh, generative biology to, ge to, to work to develop therapeutic medicines? That is generate, bio generate biomedicines. What if you can use gene editing um, you know, to develop drugs? That is now Tessera, right? So we have a portfolio of cell therapy, gene therapy, peptide, very, very diverse kind of uh, platform companies. But if you think about it, for each of those platform companies, building a platform is very different than developing drugs out of it. If you think of one is a vertical, the other is a horizontal. But think about it in a highly risky environment. If each company has uh, a, a, a vertical, but also has a horizontal, uh, you know, there is risks we all know in our business, right? So the question became, what if we had a central drug development unit within flagship so that all of the platform companies that are being created can benefit from that one drug development unit. And at a certain stage, once the platform proves that they have an asset that they're able to take to the clinic, first, maybe second asset, and you show that the platform works, then you go ballistic, you hire your own team, right? So that is how uh, the whole idea of pioneering medicines uh, came up, and that is the group that I'm part of. Um, 
So that is where uh, we work with, we have access to all of our flagship platform companies, right? So what we do is to ask those questions, where, what are the big unmet medical needs? And asking those questions, we then think back, which of these platform companies can we work with? And also on the other hand, what we do is to make these big uh, partnerships with, uh, as you see, with Novo Nordisk, with Pfizer, and also with the CF Foundation, uh, to really say, because if it's a very complex biology, you want to leverage your risk. You want to have someone on the other side um, that is going to acquire it. So the way we develop uh, all of these is our focus within pioneering medicines is only to take assets from discovery stage up to phase two. At that stage, we out-license it to one of those uh, you know, uh, companies. Or of course, if the, the biology is well understood, we develop it and eventually, of course, still sell it, right? Uh, and, and of course, that is how we are trying to um, uh, you know, bring about what we call as an, a digital innovation supply chain so that if it is a Pfizer or a you know, Novo or other company, they don't have to go to 10 other companies to get access to very unique platforms. They come to us, we are able to help them identify those. And through that, it's a win-win for, for the ecosystem, for, uh, for, for those companies, yeah. Now, in that context, uh, this is where, uh, uh, you know, within TechOps now, right, we have, uh, you know, we are now starting to work on all of these modalities. I mean, you, you, you know this quite well. But the reason I wanted to put that up is I come from a world where I was primarily in a small molecule, uh, you know, oligos, right? And I'm like, oh, boy, what is this advanced modalities? What, what, what is this that people talk about? And once you get in, you're like, boy, this is like I have to relearn, uh, you know, all my 20 years. It's, it's almost like I, there is very little I can apply. I have to learn a lot of new things. And the beauty of being able to do that is now you're starting to see how when you deal with uh, a whole portfolio that is across modalities, the power of being able to apply those modalities based on the specific disease needs that you have. So, uh, and, and lastly, that is a, 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 an overall visual. So uh, I think I explained, right, it starts with uh, an exploration idea and you can see the protocols, new codes. Usually when it's a protocol, it does not, it's just a number. Uh, but then it becomes a, um, um, you know, um, a, 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 it gets a name and it eventually it goes public. Um, and then those, those are the ones that are on the outside. Uh, so this is what I mean in terms of when you have an access to that kind of a diversity of a platform, you can do a lot of cool things. And, and that's exactly the space in which, uh, in which we are operating. Yeah. Now, uh, what I want to now focus a little bit is now to uh, highlight some of the big trends that we are seeing. Um, so, and I, I think we heard several of you mention earlier, a few years ago, or maybe uh, 10 years ago, we were probably primarily focused on small molecules and biologics. But if you look now, suddenly the, the toolbox has exploded, right? And it, it seems like every week and every month, a new VC is funding a new company, a new idea. You can only imagine where this is going, right? How can all of us get more adept and get more ready with the platforms that are evolving, that are coming our way? Uh, because obviously these new modalities are pushing the boundaries. And also, on the other hand, we are showing that these modalities are not just uh, shiny ideas, but they're starting to make good revenue. They're able to treat some really, really difficult uh, medical conditions. And I saw some colleagues from Sarepta, Vertex. I mean, you all know you're changing the world. Such beautiful, beautiful drugs you're bringing to the market, right? Um, and uh, the other trend that's also become quite obvious is, is of course, the R&D returns have continued to go down. Again, we've all known about this. I think the average cost of a drug is more than $2 billion. And now if you see, CMC also plays a big role, right? Hence all this pressure that all of us get to say, hey, can you do this faster? Can you do this cheaper? Um, so it's not like we are immune, right? So we also need to think in terms of how can we uh, actually get ahead of, 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 of the trend. The next thing that's also become quite obvious, all of, you know, again, I, you know, I was just talking about uh, GPT 4.0. For those of you who have not checked out the video that came out yesterday, it is crazy. If you look at the level of uh, advanced generative AI is making, and our, our industry is not immune, right? Uh, what, what we are seeing here uh, with the first round of drugs now starting to get to the clinic, uh, this is only going to accelerate, right? So there is either, if you look at it in terms of um, automation, where it is from a production perspective, or from a knowledge perspective, both areas we are seeing tremendous evolution happening. So the question is not if, uh, but it is when, and how are we as uh, leaders and associates going to be ready to embrace uh, what is going to come our way, yeah? Now the next part that is also uh, a, a big trend, and I think, uh, I'm sorry Scott, I think you, you were mentioning, right, you know, CDMOs have become much, uh, much, much more critical, right, uh, in terms of uh, where, where the industry is going. It's become clear 
that if we continue to build capacities like we used to do in the past, there is not enough capacity, there is too much risk. So it's become clear CDMOs are going to be even more central to the way we do business in the future. And so, you know, you can see some of the numbers there, right? So that's another big trend. So how do we, as uh, you know, um, you know, both both from an industry work work with our CDMOs? What's also becoming quite clear is, uh, you know, what what the health authorities are expecting. On one hand, um, there is enormous flexibility, especially I think we were talking about new technologies. There is a lot of willingness from the FDA. You know, I'm sure you're aware of some of those new designations uh, where there is more of an opportunity for a health authority conversation, but they're also becoming very you know, specific in terms of what, uh, what expectations they have for data traceability, EMEA even more so, um, right? You know, especially with the uh, clinical medical directive, um, uh, also from a device perspective. So the, the, the expectations are getting quite higher and higher you know, from, from a health authority perspective. Um, and then maybe the last part is, uh, you know, the workforce gaps are widening, right? Because there are, there are people who've historically grown in um, a traditional modality. There are, of course, a newer generation uh, that is starting to work on the advanced modalities, but more and more companies are starting to dabble in multiple of these, right? So how do we cross-train? How do we upskill? How do we prepare our organization for the future? So you see two main trends here. One is uh, there is a big dearth in advanced modalities. That is already clear but also in terms of the digital literacy of the organization. Are our associates ready for the future? Are we ready for the future? Um, you know, it's also becoming uh, quite uh, clear, you know, if you, if you look at some of uh, those trends. Now, if you bring it all together, what, uh, what, 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 what does it mean, uh, you know, in the, in the context of what we're discussing here? There are, of course, all of, of, of the, these trends with new modalities, with cost pressures, AI disruption, but of course, digitalization is a tool, but it is a very, very critical tool, right? And if you can see, there is not one area in there that you say digitalization out of scope for that topic. It's almost like uh, today, if you turn around, it, you know, you cannot uh, have, you know, I, I guess get through a day without thinking of a Google or an Apple or whatever, because they're ubiquitous. In everything we do, technology is so deeply embedded, and so will it be in, in all the trends that we are seeing here. So again, the question is, how do we, as 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 uh, uh, as, as industry thought leaders and and associates, really integrate this into our day-to-day -day thinking? And I also want to offer that because I come from a, a, a you know in my previous role I was with Novartis, mega ship, right? You know the organization was you know at that time the pharma organization was close to fifty thousand people. And the technical R&D organization was 3,000 plus people. And my role was supporting uh, you know, uh, all of the um, uh, digital efforts for that organization. And I can tell you, in my mind, I thought, boy, I am on top of this. I got this. Three years time, we're going to change the world. And yeah, I had to eat a humble pie, you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> because the reality is, you know, it is when you have five people you know, in a room, yes, you can, you can do things, and that's, that's where I'm going to talk about where in my current context, but when you have 3,000 people, you have a very, very different way of approaching. How do you engage the people? How do you find what is most meaningful, right? So a lot of enormous learnings. So the question is, yes, either uh, you have to think in terms of you want to digitalize, and if it's a large organization context, how do you drive that change? Change management, I think we heard about that earlier, right, and, and all the other aspects. On the other hand, if you're a small organization, you can either wait for 10 years and then talk about digital transformation or become digitally native and make it so uh, you know, meaningful so that every associate that is coming into your organization says, I want to be part of that organization because you are at the edge or you know, bleeding edge of, of where uh, science is, right? And I think for those of us who've been in the industry you know, long enough, if I ask you by show of hands, what amount of time, just in terms of, you know, in your day, if, would you say you spend 30% of your time in science? Uh, or do you say 100% of your time goes into science? Science. Exactly. Where does the rest go? It's the science of operations, meaning I want to find my data. I want to manipulate my data. Not really value added, but that's just what we do. And we've been just accustomed to that, right? We just feel that's just the way it's, it's worked. But for the new age, for the, for the new um, colleagues we're going to welcome into our business, that is not, they don't have the patience for that, right? 
how are we going to change ourselves? How are we going to prepare the organization for the future? So all of us have that imperative. And that's exactly why it is becoming more critical that um, you know, exactly all the conversations we had this morning. Now, uh, in, in that context, I want to offer uh, an, an, an analogy before uh, you know, I, I get continue with the rest of the conversation. So think back of you know, maybe five, 10 years ago, right? If I were an artist, how would I have communicated things to people, right? You know, I write my blog, I, 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 I do a video, right? I put it out and hope it goes somewhere. But then somewhere along the line, something called social media happened. Now, what did social media do, right? They figured out it's not just about the content, you know, how do you actually structure it? How do you trace it? So that you're able to say, this particular video has come from this artist, is meaningful to that person, and that is what you see in the sentiment analysis. It seems like this particular group of people in North America are very excited about that music from South uh, Asia, right? You start to make those connections. How did all of that happen? That is what happened there, right? You know, you have a data structure, you have uh, all the uh, you know, opportunity to create these insights. What now happens is, by God, you know, you have a powerful video, it goes viral, billions of views, and what happened because of all of that is an artist has become an influencer. So much so that, you know, my child, you know, my son, I ask him, what do you want to be? He says, I want to be an influencer, right? I mean, apparently it's a thing, yeah? But, but, but that's exactly, uh, you know, the power of when you have uh, the, you know, great art, right? But you're able to put it in the context, you're able to use technology. For those of you who re use Reels and all, power to you, I'm not one of those, but, um, but, but you know, this is, this is the power of, of where things are, right? Now, put that in the context of where all of us operate. If an artist can become an influencer, what does it take? for our scientists, right? Now, um, if, if you look at it, our, our framework is not that different, right? If you're a scientist today, each of us operates in one of those, right? I'm an analytical scientist, I'm a formulation scientist, I'm a manufacturing expert, whatever it is. But all of us have gone from the stage where everything was paper to some kind of a system, right? I think we can all agree that, right, that that's where we are. But what's not happened beyond that is, um, you know, if you now imagine that all of these things, if you have a framework, and I think Yash said it very nicely this morning, you think about data lakes, you think about ontologies, fair and knowledge graphs, and he explained it quite nicely. And of course, you can all, on top of that, if you're able to put generative AI, if you're able to put predictive analytics and all of the tools that he was talking about, the power now is you have the ability to connect each of those systems. You are able to now take it from what is a silo to becoming an integrated machine, and then you are able to overlay some of the uh, insights that you saw before, and you'll, 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 you'll be able to do powerful things, right, to get to CMC, and that's where we want to be, right? This is where we want to say, you want to come to our business of CMC? We are going to show you some really cool things because we are not just about analyst, analytics and uh, you know, chromeleon and uh, you know, you know, chromatography data systems. But we want to get people not only doing the foundational things, but give some powerful tools to them so they get very excited about the work they're doing. And this is going to be a long journey, but my point is, it is not that no one has done this before. You've seen an example of it previously. Now the question is, how do you uh, use that as, as, as a framework to go to the next level? Yeah. Now, Having said that, uh, I, I, I also want to offer a few examples for, for all of you to, uh, you know, to, to reflect about. Now, uh, this is an example of, of where, uh, uh, I said, within pioneering medicines, we work with our partners to, to do technical development. And just to you know, keep it simple, I'm only talking about technical development today. But of course, there is a supply, there is the quality, and all the other parts. So if I look at it, this is a high-level workflow, right? Um, so I can say, hey, you know, I know exactly what I did in my previous organization. I will start with paper, maybe I'll bring a system, right? Just do it the way we did before. Or we ask uh, ourselves, what can I do differently? Because I have a beautiful opportunity, it's almost a greenfield opportunity, I have an opportunity to create a digital native organization, what would I do, right? So here are some examples of, of what we are starting to think about, right? You know, for example, if the first step is literature search, how can we use uh, you know, large language models for it? If you're doing drug design, how do we use Gen AI for it? Uh, experimental planning, uh, you know, how do we do visualization, right? And, and, and you see a few other examples there. Now, I just want to take us through uh, some of that um, here, yeah? 
So uh, the first example here is, uh, uh, you know, as, as a scientist, the first thing we do, uh, and again, because as I said, we are working across modalities, and we are a nimble team, and we need to understand what is uh, the latest and greatest happening out there. So here we are able to use uh, uh, Causally here. You know, we are working with them to uh, build a large language model to help us understand what is the latest and greatest, because there is hundreds of news articles, hundreds of conferences. How do you just keep on top of that? Not only that you want to get access to all of those, but on top of that, you want to layer what is most meaningful. So now, with some of these tools, you're able to say, here are some 50 new papers that have come out. Out of those, these 10 are the ones that might have maybe a little bit of relevance to my area of interest. These three, you really should take a look at. And here is a synopsis of, 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 of what's happening there. It literally saves you hours, days, right? Uh, small things, but again, just to put that digital, uh, digital native mindset into, into, into everyone that, that you're working with. Through that, you're able to make research more efficient. Yeah? Now, the next example I want to share is uh, where we've been using it now to generate new drugs, right? Um, so uh, for those of you who are, who are familiar with, with the uh, you know, initial uh, discovery part, um, you know, you, you can start with uh, a, a reference, right, which is the blue part, and then say, hey, this is where and um, my competitor is. I want to increase the binding. I want to increase the specificity. I want to increase, you know, delivery or stability, right? And once you know where you want to go, now we have the ability through some of the models that are available, you're able to tune characteristics. For example, if you're working on a peptide, you say, I want to replace the third amino acid uh, with, with, with maybe something else. I want to look at a cysteine. I want to look at something different. So we are able to do all of these things in silico using a digital twin that I think we heard earlier from Yash. And through that, we are able to design de novo um, uh, you know, peptides. And because we are able to do that, what, what we've been able to do on the right-hand side is if you see the reference molecule was at the bottom, right, you know, circled in the bottom, and we were able to significantly increase uh, the specificity uh, you know, of, uh, of, of, of that uh, selectivity of, of that uh, 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 you know, uh, set of sequences. Now, this was powerful because we could have, again, done a, just created a peptide, taken it to the clinic. Four years later, we find out it's not working. But here, you're able to do it in a, in a using Gen AI, right? Another example of how we can use technology. Um, now, Beyond this, another uh, example, of course, is it's not just about the really cool advanced stuff. It's also about my associates working day to day in a research lab. For them, it's like, dude, I don't have time for the most cool things. I don't. I, I have. I still use a pen drive. Get rid of my pen drive. I can't find my data. Right. So you, you know, as 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 a leader, you have to think in terms of how do I enable technology for everyone so that everyone is getting excited about it and not a select few. Right. And in that context here, we were able to think, uh, you know, what can we do to create a structured registry, for example, within Benchlink, so people know uh, where, where uh, you know, what studies have been planned, what stage they're in, um, you know, when are they going to be completed. So it makes it so much more easier. You give power back to the hands of those associates who then say, I, am, I feel I'm in control. Now let's talk about what other ideas you have, because my, base, my basic needs have been taken care of, right? Um, now, another example is, uh, you know, we, for, for those of you who've done formulation development, uh, especially if you're looking at complex formulations, long-acting injectables, these are extremely difficult because you have many, many different components. You can have impact on uh, your burst release. You can have an impact on, on your release profile. And then on top of that, there are species differences. If you try to do an experiment, you'll probably do 60, 80 experiments just to actually understand what the hell is happening there. But in this context, if you're able to bring more of robotics uh, into, into this, right, so you're able to significantly reduce the amount of material you use um, you know, to do those uh, experiments, you're able to do it faster, what would, you, what would have taken months? You can now do it in a matter of weeks. So that, again, is, is another way you're able to significantly accelerate, better understand your, uh, your, your formulations, right? And that is another example of, um, of, of what, we are, what we are doing. Now here, uh, you know, we start to use uh, more of what we're doing now with QB division, right? Now this is again a technical process, and I think a question came up earlier. We predominantly work with CDMOs, right? And uh, in that context, we want to have a mechanism where we can even, again, we are in early stages of thinking about this, 
once we have a system in place, uh, oh, sorry, uh, you know, first in terms of technical processes, uh, this one here, uh, again, we have, again, small molecules, biologics, cell therapy, gene therapy, and if each of these, we have a different process to develop it, it becomes very difficult for us to keep track of how we are doing development. But because of, uh, you know, in our work with QB Division, we are able to bring a very consistent framework using the examples that have been provided. So we have a construct, so we can say, hey, this is your roadmap to a scientist, and now the scientist can start to use it on, on day to day. Uh, and I think another question came up, right, you know, what we're doing is to take people on a slow journey. We have projects in our, in our pipeline that are going to go to a, to a DC or clinic, let's say six months, one year later, we are already starting to engage people now to say, you have six months, all you do is to get comfortable with it. So that whenever you really need to start using, um, you know, this to your day-to-day -day projects, people are not talking about, hey, I don't have the time, no one, you know, took me on a journey, but really uh, helping people along because it is a net different way of thinking about it. Now, another example is, is uh, uh, tech transfers. And in this case, this is also very important to us because at the end of this, we need to, uh, you know, a, a, maybe a big pharma and other biotech is going to acquire this asset, right? So it is very important that the data is very, you know, in a structured way so that when it goes from a CDMO to whoever is acquiring it, it is well packaged, right? And in that context, we are also thinking, what do we do now to put in contracts of the CDMOs that we're going to work with to say this is the kind of data structure we want you to provide data to us, right? So that it becomes much more clearer in terms of the expectation setting, but also in terms of how um, you know, we can then move it from one CDMO to the other. Uh, so that's, that's another example that, uh, that, that we are working on right now. And the last one uh, is, is about knowledge management. And this uh, is, is, again, very critical to us, uh, you know, as, as all of us, um, in a few different ways. From a health authority perspective, how can we now use all of this to do structured document authoring so that it makes it much more efficient to create documents? And thanks to Yash and team for some of the great uh, frameworks that you've already developed. Uh, what is also important is eventually, like I said, we are going to sell this asset to a biopharma. And for those of you who've either been on a biotech or a big pharma, can both attest to the fact that whoever is going to acquire it is saying, what is this? I have missing data, I now need to redo all of this. And by the way, most of the time when you do a valuation, and when the final number is arrived at, there is a percentage that is taken off it because we believe it takes another six months before something is fixed. And we want to avoid that. We want to say, if you come to pioneering medicines, the kind of data quality package you get is going to be Top, top tier. And through that, we are able to make a seamless transition to what you're doing. And we believe through that, we are able to possibly get a higher valuation, right? Through that, this will all pay for itself. Um, so, and, and uh, now having said all of that, now I, I, I want to come to, um, I think something that Yash also alluded to, we are mostly on the left side. A lot of ideas, but these are all individual point to point uh, connections, right? There is maybe one, one solution connected to one idea, right? But we just wanted to get started with that kind of a mindset to say, let's at least start to think in terms of what, what is the art of possible? What can we do differently? And here are some examples that, uh, you know, that we discussed earlier. But where we really want to go is to go from point to multi-point interfaces so that all of your data goes to a central data lake. You have the opportunity for it to have an ontology. I know Yash mentioned, uh, um, I have more of an IDMP affinity. No, not really, you know, PQCMC is also perfectly fine. But whatever it is, if we as an industry get to a point where we have a common ontology, the power of that is now your verification and knowledge graphs become so much more easier. You know, whatever you see on the top, it is going to be company specific. Your visualization tools you build, robotics and all of that. But what you see in the middle, there is no value in saying this is my company's IP, right? What can we as an industry do so that we bring a, a certain level of um, uh, you know, non-competitive understanding to that space, because if you do it, all of us are going to benefit from it, right? So that is where there is, there is enormous opportunity, and I know Yash and Mike have great ideas. I'll, I'll, I'll wait for them to uh, you know, bring them forward. Now, in conclusion, what does all of this mean, right? And at least my uh, you know, experience, you know, having, having done this for some time, there is three main things. Firstly, to have a digital mindset. What does it mean for us as uh, uh, you know, scientists, leaders, whatever, ask always the question, 
what is my user going to benefit from? To have that uh, uh, you know, enormous focus on the user to always start in terms of what is going to benefit my user. Let's not think in terms of I have a hammer, what is the tool? Uh, sorry, the nail I'm going to hit, but the other way around, right? Uh, always ask yourself, let's not say this is what I've done for the past 5, 15, 20 years. What if I can do things differently? Would my organization benefit? So continuously have that mindset of reimagining ways of thinking. Obviously, we are all here because we don't want to invent new shiny things. There has to be a value for the business. So to really bring that quantitative, qualitative perspective in terms of how we do that, right? All of that as part of the mindset. We need to take people along, right? Um, most importantly, everyone is going to be at a different level. We need to be very mindful that, uh, yes, you can have your first 30% who are the fast movers. They will, they will take it forward. But let's be very mindful, not just to say, hey, I have 10 people. I think I explained to you my own situation previously. If we go too fast, we will lose the organization. How do you bring everyone along? Psychological safety, you know, for all of us to have that mindset to say, digital literacy is one of those. You are learning new things. You fail. Awesome. But let's not learn the same thing twice. But it is absolutely OK to, to, uh, to, to fail. What did we learn from it? And lastly, how do we prepare for the workforce of the future? I said it before, right? How do we excite the, the, you know, uh, all these graduates who are coming out who really want to go to a tech industry, but to say, hey, yes, you can get a paycheck somewhere else, but you don't get paycheck. I mean, in our business, you get paycheck with a purpose. Right? And that is what is different. How do you bring, how do you attract some of those uh, cool minds to, to our business? Because a lot of technology and our business are coming together. And lastly, I think we also talked about partners, right? In terms of uh, how do you identify the right partners with the shared values, with the complementary mindset? I think UB Division is one of those. And most importantly, when you look at partners, how do you also think in terms of the joint ownership, right? It's not just about, hey, here is a uh, SOW, I've delivered something. But how do you find those partners who truly are invested in it for the long run? Uh, and a combination of all of these, um, uh, I feel, right, is, 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 is a basis for all of us to think in terms of how we can, we can take this into the future. So with that, I asked uh, Microsoft Imagine uh, to, 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 to conjure up what was in my mind. And that's what it came up with. I don't know what you, what you think of it. But let's see. Let's, um, let's, let's hear a few questions, comments. Hopefully, some of those thoughts were resonating with you. Can you speak to how you sold QBD Vision to your leadership and rolled it out and got buy-in and yeah. continued to and the challenges early and how you kind of face those and address them? Yeah. Well, firstly, if I were in my previous role, it would have you know in a big organization, mm -hmm. it would take much much longer. Uh, the advantage that we have here, firstly, is an organization that is very receptive, you know, to to ideas. But secondly, you know, we also w wanted to ensure that uh, there is enough of a time to say, here is an idea. Here are some things that I've been asking for myself my whole life. I see something, but I don't want us to get excited about it, right? But let's, let's uh, uh, have the hope. Let's try it out. Let's start with a first pilot. Let's then have more people, um, you know, work on it. And let's, let's give ourselves time, right? Give it a year or two years so that at the end of that, it's not me, but it is the associates who are saying, I don't want to do, um, you know, work any other way because I really think this is meaningful. So that is where we are, right? We've not, you know, we are in a stage where we are doing a pilot. Uh, we'll see uh, where it goes. I'm, I'm quite hopeful. Uh, but, but to really, from a situational leadership perspective, not to always, in the beginning, you have to bring some thought leadership just to get the momentum, but then you take a step back to see how the organization accepts it, right? And, and eventually, it has to be owned by the organization. And then I step back and say, yeah, fine, if you guys want it, we will get it, yeah? Sure. Thank you. I want to talk about digital literacy and how we make people more digitally literate, especially when you're working with highly specialized, skilled resources that don't have time to learn a new technology or, or anything else. So something that came up interesting, we, we, we did a bit with uh, UCL, University College London. I think you referenced one of their studies on the cost it takes to bring a drug to market. I love, I love the work they've done. 
But when we were talking to them, they, they kind of told us there's there's some hesitance in pushing digital agendas, especially with, with these types of groups. You've got traditional benchtop scientists who think that AI is going to replace, you know, wet, wet science mm -hmm. altogether. And a good example of this, I think, is Apple just had to issue an apology for, uh, I think, an iPad ad they just ran where the iPad was replacing a piano and a violin and just, you know, you, you lose the integrity of the arts. And I, and I, I consider science an art. So how do, we, how do we enforce or enable digital literacy given all of that? And our resources just, they don't have the time yep. today, yeah? Yep. Oh, great, great, uh, great question. So a couple of things. Firstly, um, you know, to start with what is deeply personal to those associates, right? To start with those little things that they care about um, and to build the trust with the organization to say, hey, you had an issue with your USB drive, we took care of that. You had an issue with getting access to data, we took care of that. So take them on a journey, right? So over a period of time, it's less about you pulling, but them pushing to say, hey, you know, I want to do more of this. Or them saying, you know, please take us on, on that journey. That's number one. And secondly, to be able to show if you do this, instead of the 30% of time you spent on science, you're able to do 70, 90% of time on science, right? What else can you do with that, right? And of course, all of these things are not going to happen overnight, right? It might take five years or 10 years. In that time, how can you upskill yourself? What else can you do? Does this allow you to become um, uh, you know, more broad-based instead of just an analytical scientist who's in the lab? Can you also start to do more, more data analytics, right? So there is different ways that we can uh, take, uh, you know, take the associates on that journey, but you're absolutely right. If it, if it is seen in terms of, hey, uh, large language model, we are going to reduce the 50% efficient, 20% less people, guess what's going to happen? Right? So as, as leaders, I think we all need to be very, very mindful. Uh, and in, in terms of, yes, we need to get efficiency, but more in terms of how do we take our people along? But because at the end of the day, all of us have to buy into this. Yeah. DJ, great talk. Um, maybe very practically speaking with a lot of these new companies, new modalities, um, if you're going to deploy, say, QBD vision, where, how do you... Where do you draw the line in terms of, um, you know, I, what process version, if you want to call it that, to, to, to deploy first or to enter? I mean, we heard earlier during our talk, uh, you know, the, the process development, they're always, you know, imp improving. Some of them are small, but new equipment, new unit operation sometimes. Um, do you draw the line in the sand somewhere? Hey, GLP tox batch, that's going to be the, or something like that. So yeah. can you? Comment on that a little. That that is at least where where our current thinking is not to get involved in a. And of course, in some cases with these advanced modalities, we start very early, right? Even at a lead ID stage. But we don't want to use QB division at that stage. We really want to say when you get into a stage where you have a DC candidate, you are getting ready for let's say GMP aspects. That's when you do it uh, for the first time. But use the time those six months or nine months. Uh, because you have all the templates and tools that your organization can start to play around to say, hey, what are the kinds of CQAs I need to think about? What are the process parameters I need to think about? So you're at least preparing yourself for six months. So when the moment arrives, it's less of a, hey, no one told me, because we've, we've all been thinking about it, yeah? Thanks. Hi, Vijay, thank you for the great talk. Um, we heard a lot about you know the not new modalities and new processes and digitalization around that. Um, could you share your thoughts around how would you approach digitalization for the legacy processes that are like 20, 25 years old? And you know we have uh, analytics which has SDS page and Western blot still in it. And you know how would you transfer that information and leverage all that knowledge into building? Because the legacy, the legacy process is still like you know continuing, and like you know we are still tech transferring, and you know we are still going to make the batches. So, how are we going to, how are we going to digitalize that process and then still continue understanding the understanding the molecule in the process uh, better for the for the future to come? Uh, no, uh, absolutely. I think this is a uh, this is a, a very critical question for larger organizations who, uh, you know, like I said in my in my previous role. Um, so I think the good part, at least, is that your, your the foundation in most organizations now exists, right? It could be a LIMS, it could be CDS, whatever it is. 
Um, now, to be able to take it to the next level, to say, how do you take that digital and really contextualize it? How do you now, uh, you know, make it fair? How do you, uh, you know, you know, from an ontology perspective? Because uh, step one is more or less done in many organizations. Now, how do you take it to, to, to step two? And there are different tools that are also starting to emerge where you don't need to have uh, full-fledged uh, data lakes and you know all these ontologies because there are you know at least capabilities that I've seen where you feed it uh, you know based on how often they work in a similar document how it converts a structured uh, document one uh, sorry unstructured to a structured document so that is something that you will have to do right for legacy you know in in stepwise ways. But at the same time, also ask uh, if you're if that organization is looking at a new modality, a new capability. Let's not fall into the same conversation of hey, I need to go fast. Let's go with a very foundational system because I don't have time. And then ten years later, you are solving the same problem all over again, right? So how do you balance being getting digitally native, but at the same time also doing a slow move uh, for legacy systems? Yeah.